Sean, thank you so very much for that very kind uh, introduction. And I'm deeply honored to have this opportunity to share here at Lewis University and make my way. It's my first time on the campus uh, over here at, at Lewis. And uh, we made a wrong turn uh, coming here. We were on our way to another state. Um, but we're so very thankful to have this opportunity to be here with you and to share on this wonderful uh, and important, important topic uh, in terms of faith at uh, the border and faith and justice and how they connect with each other and the importance of those two pieces. I always like to say that uh, the two very important things that a person of faith must recognize is the deep connection between love and justice. Uh, that if all you do is love without justice, it's just sentimentality. And if all you have is justice, it can just move to what is called naked brutality or legalism. But when love and justice are married together, uh, they walk down the aisle and produce a child uh, by the name of liberation transformation. And so it becomes important that those two pieces are deeply connected uh, in our faith tradition. Uh, in the words of Cornel West, uh, uh, justice is love in action. That if you want to put your love in action, you must seek justice or fairness. Uh, the philosopher John Rawls says that one must seek not only the greatest good, but to ensure that those who are the most vulnerable uh, have the same opportunity and level playing field. And so it's been considered, uh, considered all down through history. What, what is this idea of justice? I, I believe that uh, when you merge these two ideas together, that you can find across the landscape of, of America artists, poets, and writers who are attempting to press our eyes toward this idea of love and of justice. And I believe that there is one. There is one artist, and now quite popular, uh, on the western uh, portion of the United States, in a small little section of L.A. known as South Central L.A., specifically an area by the name of Compton. A gentleman by the name of Kendrick Lamar. And Kendrick Lamar speaks about this unique idea of to pimp a butterfly. By raising this particular question, just this simple phrase, what, what Lamar does is he is raising a question about how we see that which is beautiful, but yet we want to turn it into something for profit, to pimp a butterfly. And that's simply what I want to talk to you today about how, how we can reverse this idea of trying to pimp that which is beautiful or have profit over people when it should be people over profit. Because so often we see that which is beautiful and we look at it as a market opportunity instead of a moral imperative. The moral issue before us is do we value all life or do we just value some lives more than others? Uh, the phrase Black Lives Matter is now screaming within our consciousness. It's a clarion call of resistance, uh, but it is also a movement of solidarity. It is also speaking to the fact, uh, which is very interesting to me, in the words of one uh, minister, Reverend Sekou in St. Louis, uh, he stated this. He said, it's only in America can stating the obvious be considered revolutionary. Uh, it should already be known uh, that black lives matter. It should also be recognized, recognized that the connection between those who have been marginalized, black lives and brown lives and indigenous lives, those lives matter. And scripture is so very clear, for in Leviticus it states that the immigrant who resides with you shall be to you as a citizen. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do any wrong to them. The Jewish tradition and the New Testament tradition speaks of faith rooted in these critical areas. That one must understand that when we are reading the Bible, we're reading about a people, a people who are wandering in the desert, but also a people who know about colonization, slavery, and migration. That's what the Hebrews understood. They knew colonization. What was it like to have another group of people come into your community and then all of a sudden claim that land and to migrate from one space to another space? And what is it like to be considered to be property? 
Whether you are reading from Genesis to Revelation, that particular ethic is very clear biblically because as one writer, a writer by the name of Jerome Clayton Ross from Virginia University states, he says it this way, that when you are reading the Bible, you are always reading with a double entendre. What does that mean? I mean, there are two meanings there. It is speaking on two levels because from Genesis to Revelation, you always have a group of people who are under oppression. And when you are under oppression, you sometimes use words that your people can understand, but those who are looking over your shoulder do not understand. For example, many people have heard spirituals out of the African-American tradition and think those are nice and cute songs. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. Nice song, cute song, but it's got a double entendre to it. Meaning that when I sing it, I'm not just talking about heaven. Uh, If you are looking over my shoulder, you'll think it's cute. But in reality, what I'm saying to everyone else is that when it gets dark around here, we are going to get on out of here tonight from the plantation. And how I sing it determines specifically which direction I'm going to run. And so the scripture is so very clear of this double entendre, whether you're talking about Joseph uh, and his slavery and migration, Moses, slavery and migration, or Jesus, who is under colonization. Colonization, slavery and migration. It's continual within the biblical narrative. And when you take that idea and read scripture from that perspective, All of a sudden, something unique begins to come forth. And I believe that when you have that kind of hermeneutic, that kind of understanding, you begin to recognize that there is a deep solidarity between people who have experienced the depths of pain and oppression. From the lens of slavery, colonization, and migration. That black lives, brown lives, indigenous lives matter. They matter to God. Lives, all lives, whether one is in servitude or whether they're marginalized, that it is God who is calling out of the prophetic tradition uh, that we are to recognize those who are most vulnerable. Isaiah says it this way, cleanse yourselves, uh, cease to do evil, and seek justice. Plead on behalf of the orphan and also the widow. Seek to do justice. And we are called, I believe, to build a coalition together. The words of Kenneth Lamar, we have to recognize how there are forces that seek to pimp a butterfly. But one of the first things I think that we need to recognize and understand is that we've got to break some fundamental assumptions. It's really interesting. When I visit, uh, was visiting one of my friends in, in Texas, uh, he was making some statements and, about things that were happening in Texas. Texas is a unique place. Uh, it's its own culture. Uh, it functions in a particular way. Uh, but one must understand and break some fundamental assumptions that we must be able to look with a lens of history to recognize that some of the hateful rhetoric just does not fit historically. I heard someone say, uh, I'm ready to take my country back. And I raised the question, uh, first of all, who took it? And then the second question was, it says, if you keep saying that, then I know some people who are going to stand up with you. Uh, Seminole will stand up, and the Sioux will stand up, and the Navajo will stand up. They say, well, yeah, what about us also? Uh, Recognizing that we must look through the lens of history. From 1821 to 1836, uh, places such as California, New Mexico, and Texas were a part of the Mexican community and empire. It was not until the War of Independence in 1821 when all of this shifted. And there was an influx of of settlers coming north, going down south. And part of the independence of Texas was to make slavery legal once again, because black and brown people were coming together. And in order to ensure that that did not happen, to place slavery again as the law of the land. And Texas then becomes the Texas that we know today out of that history breaking forth from its connection to Mexico. But the way that we hear politicians talk about America, they operate as if they have no historical memory. 
out of this fear of people of color. They have created this kind of narrative, not recognizing uh, that there are, there's so much unique history within this country. And so one must break the fundamental assumptions about our country and recognize that the United States that we have today, that there was a long march of history and that march of history was not always beautiful. It was not always beautiful to those people of color, to women, to anyone who is marginalized, and especially if you were poor. It is a different way of looking at history, where consistently people have tried to pimp a butterfly. And not only breaking fundamental assumptions of history, but also recognizing the immorality of policy. Profit over people. Profit over people. One of the great challenges that, especially within this election cycle, uh, people are always talking about trade and talking about uh, what can we do for jobs and this, that, and the other, not realizing that there has been a long march in America to put us in the economic position that we are right now. Uh, many do not know that uh, the way that we arrived in 2008 with the crash did not begin there, but it really started in 1936 started with the creation of what was known as the Glass-Steagall Act. That was after the Great Depression. That was passed to ensure that an investment bank and a commercial bank never merge together because investment banks gamble your money. Commercial banks are supposed to protect your money. That was the law of the land in the United States until 1980. Belief that if we deregulate at the recommendation of a person by the name of Alan Greenspan, that if we begin to chip away at this idea, then we can see an increase in profits. And so under Ronald Reagan, under George Bush, under Bill Clinton, under uh, George Bush's son, we began to chip away. But it was in 1999 with this idea called the City Group Relief Act that all of a sudden now investment banks and commercial banks could come together and as a result, they could then begin to gamble your mortgage on Wall Street. They packaged mortgages together, something called CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, and they made bets. They said, if you, Tracy, if you don't pay your mortgage, then guess what, then I receive a profit in the process. As a result, millions of people across the globe lost their homes. And we have always tried to truncate this idea as if it was one person's fault, not realizing the long march of history, breaking fundamental assumptions that we have about economic policy. Now, it does not even just stop there. Our, our economic policy had such a great effect on not only the United States, but also the rest of the Americas was something called the Monroe Doctrine in the 1800s. The Monroe Doctrine basically said the United States could go into any country and have a regime change if we don't like their policies, if we don't like their president. And that has particularly been the main function of how foreign policy in Latin America in relationship to America has functioned. We go in when we don't like something. And then there was another shift in that Monroe Doctrine that was known as dollar diplomacy to ensure that we make sure that someone operates the way we want them to operate. And so we, we passed a particular law in the 90s known as NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, absolutely destructive to Central America. Now, now, let me explain how it was destructive. They sold it as if it was going to build jobs. But on both ends, in the United States and in Central America, it decimated economies. A 4,000-year structure of great agricultural innovation in Mexico was destroyed in roughly 10 to 15 years because of NAFTA. And NAFTA works like this. Com com companies, corporations said, you know what? We really want that business down in Central America. So, so we lobby these politicians to say that, uh, I want you to pass this NAFTA idea. And then you provide subsidies for the corn that I raise here. When you provide a subsidy for the corn that I raise here, that means I can undercut the prices of corn in other markets. 
And so the small personal farms in places in Central America were decimated because when I raise my corn, I have to charge a dollar and 50 cents. But here comes that American corn, only 25 cents. I cannot compete. My farm is decimated. But it doesn't stop there. Then the large corporations like Cargill and others come down and say, well, you know, since you lost your farm, I'll be willing to buy it for pennies on the dollar. And I'll let you work on the farm you used to own. You can stay there. But now you will be a sharecropper for me, decimating an entire economy in order for a small group of people to profit. Now some will say, well, what, what does this have to do with faith? It has everything to do with faith. If you believe in this wonderful guy by the name of Jesus, real nice guy, um, and he talks about how we are to preach good news to the poor for those who are captive, we are to set them free. How can we speak with a degree of intelligence and we have not infused a moral and ethical foundation for the kinds of policies that we put forth? If all that people of faith do is come to church on Sunday and praise God and do not do any horizontal outreach, you do, not have a, you do not have a cross, you have a stick. And what you do with a stick is simply beat up other people with it. Ah, but yet, this, this policy, these subsidies, ah, this destroying of an economy created in some places where poverty would rise and whenever poverty rives, rises, an underground economy thrives. Underground economy, that means a cash-based economy. They operate all around Illinois. Some of you have operated with those things, underground economy. You would not uh, want to give anybody your debit card or anything else. You just want to give them cash. It might be shirts. It, it might be a, a CD that you're not supposed to have. It might, whatever it may be, it could be anything that you, uh, uh, you transfer with cash so that no one has a record of it underground economy. And underground economies thrive in every community, but interestingly enough, those who are predatory thrive in underground economies because there is not a system of checks and balances. The Monroe Doctrine, NAFTA, all of these particular policies put America in the position that it is today. One that was destructive to not only to the United States, but also to Central America and South America. But yet we want to use the type of destructive language. Language that sees people uh, who are not from Europe as if they are not Americans. It's very interesting. It's very, very strange and interesting. Uh, that everybody came here at some particular point on different boats, but everybody came here at some particular point. And as a result of these kinds of policies, uh, we have seen uh, the destructive political rhetoric of people trying to pimp a butterfly. So we have this uh, profit over people, Monroe Doctrine, NAFTA, all of these policies that have been destructive to human beings. And then we witness the rise of privatized prisons simultaneously. So you have on one end, Monroe Doctrine, 1800s. Uh, you then have uh, the Citigroup Relief Act in 19, uh, the 1990s and the NAFTA in the 1990s. And then the rise of privatized prisons beginning under the Nixon administration and moving through every single administration since then. Better known as the war on drugs. One of the greatest lies that have ever been told to American people. A war on drugs. It's not a war on drugs. It's a war on poor people. Let me give you an example. In the city of Chicago, every police department, every district is given a grant from the United States government to arrest people who are dealing drugs or using drugs. A grant. An economic incentive to arrest people. You do not have the same incentives for homicide, for robberies or sexual assaults. But there is an economic incentive 
to arrest people who are supposedly doing drugs. As a result, the number one people who end up arrested are those who are nonviolent drug offenders, usually people who are smoking something known as weed. In Cook County Jail, 9,000 inmates, no, I'm sorry, 7,000 inmates, 4,000 of them are mentally ill on some form of medication. But they have, we have incentivized this idea of arresting people and ended up creating an industry. And as a result of that industry, then Wall Street comes in in the 90s to say, I have a solution. Let us privatize your jails. We are much more efficient at it. And so a group like the GEO group uh, comes in and says that uh, I'll privatize your jail. It'll be more efficient. And at the same time, I'm going to lobby for occupancy rates because I know that I make more money when there are more people in jail. So I will lobby every politician to ensure that they pass harsh sentences because it helps my bottom line. But one of the things that they do not tell anyone is simply this, is that when it comes to arrest and it comes to this idea of deportation, there is a lot of money to be made. So when people are deported in uh, the 70s and the 60s and the 50s, usually there was around a week turnaround at the longest, usually two to three days. But now it is between nine and 16 months. Why would you hold someone in jail for nine to 16 months when you say that you want to deport someone? Here is why. If you are in a privatized jail in the United States, you have been arrested and you are going to be departed, deported. Nine to 16 months, you will be in a jail. But while you are there for nine to 16 months, they want you to utilize your labor to maintain the prison. So the prisons are being maintained by prisoners. All the cleanup work, all the work being done. In other words, they are getting free labor for nine to 16 months. Talking about a bottom line, could you imagine running a business and someone gave you free labor for nine to 16 months? Your, mar your profit margins would look pretty good for nine to 16 months. So, so we have this mass incarceration system. We have an immoral policy of profit over people. And the question is, what, what, what do we do? We must make a moral and ethical case, a case that recognizes that uh, people at the center and God uh, at the center, recognizing that those who are most vulnerable must be lifted up. That we have to have a, an understanding of history and I believe that the understanding of how we bring all of the different divergent groups within the United States is spoken of specifically culturally in a, sp in a space known as jazz. So now how in the world does jazz have anything to do with policy? Oh, real easy. Because jazz speaks about democracy in a unique way. In New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, Africans came from spaces uh, such as uh, Haiti and other spaces, making their way uh, to uh, New Orleans, either by force or because they decided to migrate. They came into these spaces in, in New Orleans. And on Sundays, because it was a Catholic parish, people were given days off. And there they were, Africans and French and Spanish and Native Americans, they got together in a space called the Congo Square. They all couldn't speak the same language, but they could speak an international language, the language of music and of beat and of dance. And as a result, the music we know as jazz was born in that space. And what is unique about jazz is that it brings together elements that should not come together. The saxophone, which is for the marching band, uh, and is only to be in the marching band, gets together with the piano. And the piano, uh, which is to be for classical music, uh, gets together with a trap drum set, and the trap drum set comes together with a bass, but not with a bow, but you pluck it with your fingers. And each musician is given the right to solo. In other words, the saxophonist never tells the piano, you must sound like me. 
The piano never tells the drum set, you need to sound like me. Everybody is given the right to solo out of their own unique cultural narrative. Jazz was teaching America democracy before America even knew what democracy was all about. That everybody has the right to bring something unique to the table. And that is what Christ was doing, coming into these small villages and allowing those who thought that you have to operate a certain way, he says, no, the woman at the well also has the ability to be able to speak with power to people. You will never be able to speak to John nor Peter. Speaking to the father who has a child who is dying or a woman with an issue of blood. Bringing together people that were considered to be outcasts and all of a sudden they are part of the kingdom of God. What a beautiful tapestry and mural that God is creating. In the midst of all of this. So, so maybe uh, the possibility of our shifting narrative in this country is to view things from a jazz possibility. That everybody has a right to solo. Everybody has something to bring to the table. Everybody has something to contribute. Something beautiful. And we create a mosaic in the process. And no longer will we have people trying to pimp butterflies. But in the words of Kendrick Lamar, that even though you may be messed up, I may be messed up, but as long as we got God, we know we're going to be all right. Thank you. Mm -hmm.